going to talk about rehabilitation after ACL reconstruction, so anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. And I'm going to base the lecture around the aspeter guidelines, but also consider um, a couple of the other guidelines as well. So let's just uh, begin by starting to look at some basic a revision of the ACL um, anatomy or structure and biomechanics. So the anterior cruciate ligament resists uh, tibial movement, so anterior translation of the tibia on the femur. Um, but it only resists about 85% of that anterior translation, so it's not the only structure that resists that. It is a neural structure, so it has uh, nerve fibres from the posterior uh, branch of the tibial nerve. And so those will give it um, um, the ability to enhance proprioception. So it has mechanoreceptors within it, so uh, Ruffini corpuscles, um, for example, uh, within it. Um, but it also has free nerve endings, which would be responsible both for uh, nociception, so the possibility of uh, pain generation, but also for the release of neuropeptides, which um, is one aspect of, of uh, the importance of uh, healing of the, uh, of the ACL itself. So um, we've got that sort of um, neural flow from the uh, anterior cruciate ligament, which of course will be lost when we have a rupture and we have a repair. So we would need to make up for that with, uh, with um, you know, a, a additional exercise. So that would be a consideration for our, uh, our rehabilitation. So the ACL uh, reflex is um, a stimulus which occurs through the ACL as a result of tibial translation, which should um, force the muscles to stabilize the joint as it's as the bones are moving relative to each other. Um, and that would be a consideration during our rehabilitation and that we would need to enhance that um, because it will be impaired as a result of injury, as a result of the surgery and a result of the swelling. So the blood flow to the, um, to the ACL comes from the middle genicular artery, but there's an avascular zone close to the intercondylar uh, fossa of the tibia. So the, um, the healing rate um, can be uh, impaired. It is a tough structure, so about 90% collagen and about 10% uh, elastin. So there is a springiness, a, a sort of resilience within the, within the tendon. So when we're doing a repair, we have to try to reproduce that in some shape or form. It's a single ligament, but it's in two bundles, two portions. So there's an anteromedial portion, which is tighter in flexion. And there's a posterolateral portion, which is tighter in extension. So it sort of gives it the ability to remain tight throughout a whole range of motion. Um, so it's a very uh, clever design. And because these bundles curve slightly or twist slightly, it means that as the uh, the ligament is stretched, potentially it actually gets stronger because the, the ligament fibres will unwind and, and uh, become more aligned. Now, I've, I've said that there are two bundles, and there normally are, but there are also anatomical variants. So some people will have a single bundle, some people will have uh, an additional um, bundle. So... Um, when we uh, talk about this translation uh, resistance ability, um, we have to remember that it's not the only structure which will resist that translation. So we also have um, 
you know other structures around the knee so looking at this this cross section of the knee which i've i've um taken from my sports injuries book um you've got you know that the the other hamstrings so you've got the semi semitendinosus semimembranosus you've got the biceps attaching to the head of the the fibula here so anything you know sort of posterior will help to uh, stabilize the knee um as will the you know iliotibial band etc so you know, muscles feeding in and around that joint will stimulate this ACL um, or be stimulated by this ATL uh, reflex. And one of our aims in rehabilitation is to build up that muscle power, but also to shorten the the ability of that muscle to contract rapidly. So the sort of reflex contraction latency of the muscle so that the muscles can use their force over a shorter period of time um, and when we do that we are enhancing stability through load sharing so we're saying well let's see if we can take more of that load that translation um, from the you know from the muscles um, rather than from the ACL which is now impaired so that's the aim of, of, uh, um, of our rehabilitation Another consideration is that I mentioned that the ACL has got a blood flow and the ACL has nerves which will secrete uh, neurochemicals. And as a result, it does have an ability to heal. And over the last 10 years, certainly, that the interest in that ability has, has increased. And we'll go on to that um, in a second. The final thing to say is that the rehabilitation needs to be of a high level. So we're going to look at the Aspeter guidelines, which is rehabilitation in elite sport. Now, I would argue very strongly that all individuals, whether you're working in an office, whether you're you know, working on a building site, have the ability to rehabilitate to that higher level. It's just whether they have the opportunity to do that. And, and you know, part of the reason... Um, for what we're doing as therapists would be to give them that give them that ability. So let's get on to the reconstruction then. So we've got a knee where there has been an ACL rupture, and that ACL rupture may take on several forms. So it might be that the ligament has completely torn and the two stubs of the ligament have retracted, or it may be the ligament is overstretched and it's simply lost its ability. So it's continuous, but it's but it's sort of lost its uh, its um, ability and it's become floppy, if you like. So you know that that um, that that rupture can be seen um, biologically. So we can look at that on our, on an MRI scan. And so the options to repair that will be one of three things, really, or the options that we have to, to uh, manage that will be one of three things. The first option would be to watch and wait. So simply to say, well, we're not going to do anything, knowing that the ACL may repair, but also knowing that uh, that anterior translation can be taken by other structures. So do we need to repair or not? And secondly, then, if we do need to repair, how are we going to do that? So we could use an allograft. So that would be something from outside the body. So a synthetic ligament or a ligament from an animal or a ligament from a cadaver, from, from a, a dead person. Now, all of those will, um, will be effective but will also, they, firstly, they'll be less effective than uh, using tissue from, from uh, the same patient. But also you get a higher risk of infection and a higher risk of rejection of those tissues. So nowadays, autograph um, tends to be the treatment of choice. And there are several options. The two most common are to take a part of the patella tendon or to take some of the hamstring tendons. And those are the two that we will, we will be looking at today.
So when we're taking the patella tendon, what we're doing is taking a small amount of bone from the patella, a small amount of bone from the tibial tubercle, and the tendon in between. So it's known as a bone patella tendon bone um, transfer. And because we are on, on in, in, in both cases, what we're doing is trying to replace the function of the ligament. So what we will do is bore a hole from the tibia through into the femur and the alignment of that, that hole or that portal will be approximately the pathway that the ACL took. And so we want healing. Now, if we have a bone patella tendon bone um, graft, then we're... we're um, putting that through that hole through 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 the portal in this direction and bone is then healing into bone so that will heal faster than if we take hamstring because in order to take hamstring what we're then going to do is still put that tissue through through the portal but then we have to put a plug on the end and that plug would be a button or in this case a stainless you know stainless steel screw and that won't heal as effectively as bone on bone so when we're taking the hamstring normally what we would do is to take a piece from the semitendinosus um, a tendon from the gracilis combine those two and fold them over so that we have four bundles, so a thicker, stronger tissue. Now, when we do that, we put that through that portal and we secure that with something, and you know, different surgeons will use different things, but a screw or a plate or a button, and then we're left with basically a hole. So um, what will happen here is that, that tendon will not directly reform, but it will reform with scarring. So the consideration in rehabilitation would be different then. So we've got to focus on a loss of um, hamstring function, where we've got a hamstring tendon effect, a uh, tendon graft, but we've got a, a loss of um, extension of knee extension where we've got the patella tendon graft because we've taken part of the tendon away. So both of these will need time to heal. So when we're when we're looking at rehabilitation we can look at that time scale and say well the first time scale is that we need to recover from the surgery itself, from, from the incisions, from the portals, the anesthetic etc etc. And that would be the immediate effect. The short term effect will be that this tissue has to knit together. So in the same way as we would say, well, if you've you know, broken your leg, the bones need to heal. So this tissue needs to, to, to knit together. So that would be um, a biological consideration. Now, within therapy, we talk about a biopsychosocial approach. So the bio would be to do with tissue, so the biology. And we're saying here, well, bone will heal with bone. That's biological. Hamstring will heal on, you know, it, 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 once it's secured. That's biological. The psycho would be something to do with psychology with the mind so that would involve things like coordination balance etc etc so something neural and something to do with the biology perhaps fear of of re-injury um fear avoidance and then finally we have the the, the social side and, and to say well what are we putting this individual back into? So if we're going to plan a rehabilitation program, is that rehabilitation program going to be the same for an elite level footballer as it would be for an office working worker, you know, sitting behind a desk? Well, clearly not. So our rehabilitation guidelines then are, are to do with somebody's job, to do with somebody's requirements. So that would be the sort of social side. So when we look at the rehabilitation planning, we've got two aspects really. One aspect would be to say, well, time. How, how long do we expect each of these stages of healing to be? 
And the second aspect would be to say milestones. So what can we achieve and when can we achieve it? And that's how we're going to we're going to judge our rehabilitation and we're going to focus on these two then. So the BTB, the bone patella tendon bone um, or, um, graft and the hamstring tendon graft. So one of the first questions we should be asking at this stage is, um, and, and that I've sort of alluded to this, is to say, well, do we need surgery at all? And certainly 20 years ago, the case was, well, if you, if you injured and ruptured your ACL, we would confirm that perhaps on a scan and perhaps on a, on, a, on a test of stability of the knee. And that test may be something like a Lachman's anterior draw test, or it may be something like an arthrometer test. So it would be a passive test to determine as a therapist whether your knee was stable or not. And we would then say, well, it isn't stable, so we're going to stabilize it. Moving further on, we can look at this and we can say, well, OK, we can determine stability, but what we can do is look at stability function rather than simply structural. So whether the MRI shows us that we've got something healed or not, that would be um, part of the assessment. And when we look at that, we discover some interesting things. So firstly, on the on the side of biology, some ACLs will actually heal, which we originally thought wouldn't happen. And secondly, some individuals can regain full function, full stability of their knee without biological healing. So there have been a number of studies looking at this. So this is the Cannon trial. And what they looked at was to say, well, if we have ACL um, reconstruction, typically, it is said that we would need to do that fairly quickly. What happens if we delay that ACL reconstruction? Well, we're looking at restoration of function and then we're looking at healing judged on an MRI. And what we're sealing, what we're sealing with this is, is that those individuals where the repair is delayed, many of them actually have confirmed healing within a five-year period, confirmed on an MRI scan. That's the first thing. The second thing is that many individuals re, so, so get full function that, that, they, that they want and is acceptable to them. So they can use their knee for everything that they want. Now, of course, what they want would vary. So somebody might say, well, my knee is fine because I can walk my dog and I can go up downstairs and I can play with my grandchildren. Somebody else may say, well, my knee is not fine because I can sprint and I can zigzag, but I can't play first division football. So it's what is acceptable to the patient. So it's patient focused care that we're dealing with here. So between 63 and 93 percent of these individuals achieved that symptomatic acceptable state. But some were healed and some were not. So in other words, some individuals in the reconstructed group didn't find that their knee was acceptable. And many individuals in the non-healed group did find that it was acceptable. So the conclusion of this, this particular study you know, is, is in the abstract here. There was a high rate of ACL healing in patients managed by rehabilitation alone. And these individuals reported better patient reported outcomes compared to the non-healed or the reconstructed groups. So in other words, we would need to assess function. And the, the general consensus nowadays is if we can delay reconstruction, it gives us the opportunity to be able to do two things. Firstly, for the knee to recover, and we'll look at that in a second as to why that's important. 
uh, to recover from that initial injury, so the insult to the tissues, and secondly, for us to judge whether rehabilitation is likely to be useful. Now, there's a continuation of this study. So Steph um, Philby has, uh, uh, and, uh, and the team have sort of continued this and said, well, OK, can we further enhance the potential of healing? And the answer to that would seem to be yes. And, and, and this is ongoing work. But what they did was to stabilize the knee at 90 degrees of flexion. So in a brace at 90 degrees of flexion over a four week period for 24 hours. So the person would have to, to move around with the knee flexed at 90 degrees on a, on a you know, on a, on a sort of uh, a, a, a scooter. Um, and what they found is that they could actually enhance this healing. So, um, uh, you know, and, and we would then need to do further studies to say, well, is that healing functional? And is that healing better than reconstruction? So, you know, the jury is still out, but I think it is a, it is a, uh, a consideration. Okay, so when we, when we then um, look at our, um, our rehabilitation, we can say, well, we're doing one of two things. So we, if we are reconstructing, it's either patella tendon or it's hamstring, and there will be differences in the rehabilitation requirements. So um, the uh, bone patella bone um, is graft is likely to give um, a, a reduction in the ability to fully extend the knee, and it's likely to give more patella femoral pain syndrome or more patella femoral um, pain in general. It's also going to alter the mechanics of the patella. Um, and so typically what would happen is the patella is pushed downward. So patella barge, so a lower resting patella. With our hamstring tendon, we have essentially taken the tendon away. We need to allow some healing there. So we're not going to go into full extension, um, or certainly we're not going to go into hyperextension. We can go uh, into extension, but not full extension uh, initially. And that reduction in hamstring power may persist, may persist for some time, for up to two years. Now, whether that is a functional um, problem or not, you know, depends on the patient. But, you know, we've got two different types of um, consideration there. So I think the important thing to realise here for the patient is that this is a major injury. So often they will simply assume, well, you know, I've done something catastrophic for my knee when I was skiing or I fell off a bike or a horse or whatever. I'll have an operation and it'll be fine. And we know that that isn't the case. So we've seen that even with reconstruction surgery, not all individuals get to a point where they have acceptable function of the knee. Um, and if they do get to that point, it's going to take some considerable time, as, as we'll see later. So these are the guidelines then. These are the aspiter guidelines and I've put links and various different things on there. Um, and, um, you, you know, these are good guidelines, but we have to remember that these are focused particularly on elite sport. So there may be different considerations for the average person in the street. And also guidelines are through systematic reviews which is, and meta-analyses, which are population studies. Now, when we're dealing with an individual, we would need to chop and change that and, and make that patient focused. So these are not set in stone. So why are these guidelines necessary? Well, essentially, because we've got loads of different patients, loads of different surgeons doing similar but not the same um, you know, operations and loads of different therapists doing similar but not the same rehabilitation. And we need to get things and, and say, well, OK, what what have we found works best? And we should be applying more of that. And what have we found that we believe to be good, which actually isn't? And we need to do less of that. So it's important because 65 percent of athletes return to their pre-injury level of activity. So not 100 percent, not 90 percent, only 65 percent 
return to their pre-level of activity and only 55% return to their same level of competitive sport. So they might go back to, to professional football, but at a lower level. So there's only half of them. So, you know, that, that's, that's not good. Why would that occur? Well, for a number of reasons. Firstly, it could be graft failure. So, you know, the operation has to be done again because the, the, the graft has, has torn or not taken. Secondly, in order to injure the ACL, it takes a huge amount of force. So normally it is a force on the knee, which is moving into a valgus orientation. So the knee is moving inwards as the foot is moving outwards. As we're twisting the body, you've got full body weight, you've got full movement, and so you're, you're moving at speed. So there's a lot of force placed onto the knee because we're talking about a tough structure here. And for that to rupture, other things will be injured. So we're likely to get meniscal injuries. We're likely to get bone injuries. So as that knee is, um, that knee is forced inwards, the inner aspect of the knee will open up. So the, the um, meniscus may tear. And as the knee is, uh, is twisted, the collateral ligament may tear as the joint is opened up. And as the joint opens on one side, it compresses on the other. So the bone can be compressed laterally. So all of these other injuries, so-called comorbidities, will be a consideration. Now, you know, we're focusing on the ACL because it's the major structure, but all of these others will need to recover as well. And so that will take time. So that's why it's now thought that a delay to reconstruction surgery to allow that hot knee to recover is probably going to be something which is which is better and to give us a better result. And also during that time when it is recovering, we can test our rehabilitation and, and find out how effective it's likely to be. So we've got graft failure. We've got comorbidities, and then we come on to the rehabilitation itself. So typically, biological healing of that graft will take about nine months, so six to nine months. So we can judge that on an MRI in the same way as we would look at you know, an X-ray to say, well, you've fractured your femur, it's now healed or it's not. We can judge that and we can say, well, we have full structural healing. That's gonna take some time. Secondly, when that heals, is the knee stable and fully functional? So the fact that your ACL is healed on an MRI doesn't mean that you can hop and you can skip and you can jump. So you may not have the confidence to do that. So biologically, in terms of our biopsychosocial approach, biologically we're confirming healing, but your fear of rehealing or your skill of doing the movement and your, your uh, use of proprioception is now a limiting factor. So the limiting factor may be something which is non-biological. So the rehab is gonna take some time and we need to get the patient hooked into that. Now, it might be that the patient is not willing to do that or the patient is unable to do that. So there may be social influences. They might not have the time to do it because of their job pressure. They might not have the facilities to do it. Not everybody has a fantastic gym, a fantastic um, rehab centre. They, they may not have um, the instruction to do that. So we would need to look at that. So, you know, an aspect of e inadequate rehab will uh, result in, uh, in failure. And then finally, premature return to sport. So, you know, being forced either through peer pressure or simply forcing yourself to return and, and, and getting fed up and saying, I'm just going to go back and I'm going to do it. And you get re injury. And that re-injury may be to the graft itself, or it may be patellofemoral pain we've mentioned, altered knee biomechanics, reduced total, total function. So it may be nothing to do with the, the graft. The graft is fine, but the function of the knee hasn't, hasn't returned. You're returning to sport with reduced function to your knee 
and you get a further injury or a secondary injury. So we've got a you know a variety of different things to to consider with our um, rehabilitation. So these are um, uh, this is another paper called the um, called the Optini consensus, um, and this was uh, Jackie. Uh, Whitaker's paper. So the full paper was um, Colvenor, and then Jackie um, took a, a consensus of that and, and came up and said, "Well, you know, what of what what from this consensus can we use?" And this is, you know, this is all open source, and there's a there's a um, an Aspener um, Aspeter website that you can use, and with the Optini, there's an Optini website that you can use, and we, you know, we've got various different things that we can consider. So we're looking here at the level of evidence, so strong evidence or low, low, you know, poorer evidence, but still positive evidence. So sorts of things which, you know, there's high evidence for that the quads need to work. And if they're not working early on, we need to get them working in some shape or form. And neuromuscular electrical stimulation may help with that. Open and closed chain is similarly effective. So traditionally, we've said, well, early on, avoid open chain. But nowadays, we've found that it's patient specific. So if it's not driving symptoms that you can use open chain, so you, you don't need to stick to closed chain. Um, but it would be a progression. And, and both of those are important. We, we want some sort of supervised rehabilitation. But if they can't have that, that doesn't mean that they're going to fail what we'd have to do is to structure that program and come up with a program that they can use for themselves. And when we do that, that can be as effective. So the fact that you don't have access to full rehabilitation services shouldn't limit you. It used to be the case that bracing was used, and we now know that that actually isn't important post, um, post um, you know, uh, reconstruction, it may be more important if we're looking at non-reconstruction, we're trying to stimulate healing. Um, but, you know, bracing can be useful if, if, it is, um, if it is useful to modify symptoms, but it's not essential. Pre-operative rehabilitation is something which is useful. So in other words, um, not sending the person to surgery immediately, but having some sort of rehabilitation before the operation, that can be useful. And targeting the pain and the swelling and giving um, the ability to target that to the patient, so to try to enhance self-efficacy uh, can be useful. And some form of psychological intervention, whether that's separate or whether that's something to do with your rehabilitation, uh, can be useful as well. So those are the Optini um, uh, consensus guidelines. So uh, that would be useful. And um, these guidelines come up with these clinical recommendations. And I've uh, given a link to that because that's quite useful for clinicians. So let's get through to the Aspener guidelines then, Aspeto guidelines. Um, and essentially, they came up with five themes that we'll go through. So the first one was the timing and what we should put in to our rehabilitation. So what we put in and when we do it. Secondly, whether physiotherapy modalities are useful once that reconstruction has been done. So the surgeon has done their job. What is the job of the therapist in terms of modalities and are they useful or not? When we're going to do action uh, exercise, what are we going to use and when are we going to do it? How's that going to affect the surgical outcome? When we progress that exercise, we can use both strength and motor control. When, when and what do we use? So strength in this consideration would be more bio in terms of the biopsychosocial. So we would say, well, we're trying to enhance muscle contraction, build up muscle bulk, etc. So it's more of a structural consideration. 
motor control would be more psychology. So it would be more to do with skill, proprioception, etc. And, and clearly both strength and motor control have huge overlaps, but we're sort of in these guidelines, we're dividing those two. So we're saying, well, there needs to be a strength base on upon which to build, you know, the, the motor control. Um, and then when do we allow return to activity? And with that activity, we're looking at driving, running, and sport. And, and, and again, when we're not looking at elite sport, we would we'd be replacing those with other things. So when do we return to activities? All right, so timing and structure then. So the prehab then, so doing some form of rehabilitation before the surgery can be useful. So in that time, even if we do nothing else, we can use some education. So we've got to lay it out to the patient that this is um, a, a, an operation which is effective, but it's not going to give you, or it's unlikely to give you, 100% knee function. So your knee function has changed. We're replacing, but not, not sort of regrowing the, the, uh, the ACL. So and it's going to be as, as good as we can get, but it may not be perfect. And secondly, that rehabilitation is going to take a long time. So it's not going to be the case that you're going to go to surgery, you're going to have an operation, you're going to wake up the next morning and your knee's going to be perfect. You're going to have to go through a rehabilitation program. And that rehabilitation program is going to be probably a minimum of nine months up to 24 months. So it's you know quite a commitment and we're going to try to build that in with your daily requirements, but it's quite a commitment and it's quite quite something that you you know you have to do. Without that, it's not going to be effective. So um, it's not the case that you can you can have the surgery and you can ignore everything. Um, you need to put some work in, and if you're willing to do that, you will get a far better result. And unfortunately, if you're not willing to do that it's likely that you will get a worse result. And, and we need to lay that out to individuals. And then we then need to say, well, these are the sorts of things that you are going to have to do. At that stage, we can also say, well, how is the knee functioning? So you know, is there a flexion contracture? So, so can they not extend their knee at all? Can they voluntarily contract that muscle? Because if they can't, we know that it's, you know, the, the, the function is much poorer. If we know that there's a, a, a tear which has been confirmed, is the knee unstable functionally? So, you know, does it give way going up and down stairs? Can they hardly walk? Can they take their weight on it? Or do they simply walk in saying, well, you know, I've had a test, I've had a scan, and I've got an ACL tear. And yet they can, they can walk, they can use stairs, they can contract the muscle, they can perhaps, you know, do a squat. So that, you know, that, that would indicate that their, their rehabilitation is likely to, to uh, be more advanced. So we're preparing them for that. Um, in, in that initial phase, um, we might use balance training, perpetration, vibration training. We might also consider unsupervised exercise, and we know that providing it's they're doing the right thing, that that is, that is fine, so they don't need continuous coaching. Um, and we know that you know biological healing is going to take about nine months so um, it's going to take some time. So expanding on, on, on those guidelines then, we need a pre-op visit, you know, uh, uh, at least one pre-op visit. We need to perform a needs analysis and say, well, what do they need from their knee? So, um, you know, if they're working uh, as a builder, you need to be able to climb ladders. If you're playing professional football, you need to be able to cut and zigzag. If you're working on a farm, you need to be able to walk on an uneven surface. So what do they require from their knee? We know that there is a time scale for healing. So what are we going to do immediately after surgery? So from zero to three days, what are we going to do for the first week, the second week, et cetera, et cetera? Um, where that patient is highly motivated, then they can do um, they can do non-supervised exercise. 
and also where they don't have access to physiotherapy, they can do non-supervised exercise and, and that would be fine. The um, duration of, or the, con the, 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 um, the focus of the rehabilitation can be assessed in two ways. We can assess it in terms of time, so what you do after a week, a month, a year, but we can also assess it through criteria. So when you can achieve this, when you can stand on one leg, you can move on to the next phase. When you can jump, you can move on to the next phase. So we're, we're, we're looking at both of those because clearly we can have five individuals and at six weeks, they would be considerably different. So we're not just, we're not just saying a time scale is important. We would also need to prepare them for the fact that, it, that it's unlikely that it's going to be a straight road. So this is what <laughs> this is what the patient believes, isn't it? You know, I'm going to start my rehab and it's going to continue and it's going to be fine. This is what we as therapists know that's going to happen. You're going to have flare ups and you're going to have setbacks. So a flare up would be where there's a sudden increase in symptoms. So I'm doing my rehab. I've done exactly what the physio has said. But my knee is swollen up and it's suddenly become painful. Why is that? Well, because you don't have control over everything. So you might have twisted or turned in bed. You, you can't control that. You might have wanted to go for half an hour drive, but actually you got lost and it took an hour. You, you had no control over that. So don't beat yourself up. These things are normal. Take a rest and then restart. The same as this, with, with, with the setback, you know, I was using two pounds and then I went to 10 pounds and then I took 12 pounds. But now I, I've gone to 12 pounds and I can only use eight. So, you know, there's a setback. What have I done wrong? It may be nothing. It may be that, you know, you've done nothing wrong. We will look at that and say, well, is there a trigger which has caused that? Let's take some time. Let's rest. Let's recover and restart. Now, unless you prepare the patient for that, what can often happen is somebody comes in, in in three years time and they say, well, you know, I did the rehab, but my knee started to hurt. And so I gave up. And, and that's why the rehab fails, because we as therapists haven't prepared them for the fact that there will be flare ups and there will be setbacks. And, you know, we, that's going to happen with everything, isn't it? And I, I will often use an analogy in a gym and say, well, you know, you, when you're when you're using a gym, you know, your, your training doesn't necessarily go smoothly all the time. Sometimes you need more recovery. Sometimes you need a little bit more rest. That is human. That is perfectly normal. And it doesn't mean you're guilty of doing something incorrect. All right. What about modalities then? Well, many of the modalities are, are not essential, but they could be used more in the early phases for pain reduction and for reduction of swelling. If we can hand the responsibility for those over the patient, then so much the better because we're building self-efficacy. So something like TENS, some, a TENS machine that we can loan them, something like um, uh, 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 an ice pack that they can apply themselves is, you know, quite useful. Neuromuscular electrical stimulation, so a sort of complex type machine, can be useful where that muscle isn't, con isn't contracting voluntarily, so that might be useful. Similarly, EMG feedback might be useful if we have access to these. Um, but they're not essential. So if you don't have them, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not that important. Um, we've said that bracing isn't, isn't you know, 100% necessary, but it could be something that which, you know, enhances rest. We could equally well use taping if it, you know, if it helps them temporarily. Um, continuous passive motion, it used to be thought that if you gave continuous passive motion, you'd get a better result because it's stressing the the ligament. Nowadays, we know that the, the, the result isn't better with that, that just by, um, you know, sitting and standing and moving around, you're stressing the ligament sufficiently. So CPM machine isn't, isn't essential. All right, looking then at expanding those, then we've gone through cryotherapy, we've gone through electrical modalities, things such as blood flow restriction, 
an elite sport may be used. Things such as body vibration. Um, if, you know, if you're going to the gym and they have a vibration plate, could be useful. But if you don't have them, you know, it's it, they're not essential. When we come to our exercise initiation, then we're looking at what we would do immediately after surgery. So immediately after surgery, you've got to recover from the surgery itself. So sort of zero to three days, we would say, well, you know, you've been through surgery, you had a general anesthetic, you've had some cuts and bruises, your knees being moved around, you've got to recover from that. So, you know, there's going to be very little activity. What we probably want is some isometric contraction of the quads. You're going to have some patella um, pain, so we'll put um, you know a cushion behind your knee to avoid full extension, and we'll try to just do some some bracing. Um, because you've had an effect on your knee, you've had a general anaesthetic. We're going to try to enhance circulation, so you might do some work on your upper body, and and you might do some breathing exercises, for example. And once we move on from that, and you recover from the surgery, then it's a question of saying, well, in that in that early phase, we want to stop, um, you know, atrophy of the muscle. So we want to do that as quickly as possible. That would be the time when we need neuromuscular stimulation, or we need static contractions. Now, it used to be said that we would avoid, or we should avoid, open chain, and that's not really the case nowadays, but what you would want to do is to avoid putting too much stress on the on the graft. So, you know, we're going to support the leg, and we're going to use um, isometric and, and sort of tightening, um, quads tightening, hamstring contraction type movements, but relatively gentle. And it's, and it's unlikely at this stage, providing it's not resisted, it's unlikely that you would be able to produce sufficient force to, to damage the graft. So we're on, on sort of gentle exercise, both open and closed chain can be useful and it would be patient specific. So some people find it more useful to use closed chain. And we're going to we're going to get them weight bearing or partial weight bearing fairly soon. So you know a typical uh, exercise would be well you know partial weight bearing standing a resistance band around the knee attached to a chair so that we're the knee is slightly flexed and we're pushing it straight and that type of limited action uh, is a closed chain and then obviously just um, you know tightening the thigh can be an open chain or you know standing with your with your um, uh, you know, against a wall with um, a, a, a soft balloon or a ball behind your knee, just gently bracing. So that would be, again, an example of a, a closed chain early movement that we can use. So that would be our exercise initiation. Um, and then obviously um, the fact that, you know, you've had a knee operation, but there's nothing wrong with your shoulders or your spine. So we can we can plan and do um, a little circuit to make it more more sort of interesting with using the upper body and, and the trunk. Um, so we're, we're, we're limiting in that early phase our active motion, but we're trying to increase that gradually. So below about 60 degrees, we're using open and closed chain, trying to get muscle contraction, but at the same time not compromising the graft uh, integrity. Um, Depending on the graft type, we would um, avoid full extension with the hamstring graft initially, and we would be um, trying to stimulate full extension as soon as possible with a patellofemoral graft, simply um, simply because the the kneecap needs to 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 move within reason. Certainly, you know, within the, you know, after um, two to three weeks. Uh, we can use both eccentric and concentric, and as I've mentioned, um, we want to do both open and closed chain. So we're now on to the point then where we're going to, to enhance this training, um, and the guidelines show us that 
in elite sport, the use, exclusive use of isokinetic is, is not useful, and that, again, used to be a fashion. So if you've got an isokinetic machine for measurement and for, for early rehab, it may be useful. It's certainly not the only thing, and if you haven't got it, it's not, not a problem. So isotonics are useful, you know, resistance bands, weights, etc., are much better for functional outcomes. And then the exercise needs to be progressive. So, you know, progressive strength, progressive flexibility, et cetera, et cetera, preparing for setbacks and, and, and flare-ups. So again, expanding this open and closed chain, concentric and eccentric, strength-based and motor skill-based, both important, gradual progressions from limited actions to more functional actions to reflect the requirements of the patient. And things such as core training can be useful as we move on to whole body control. And we'll look at that in a, in a second. And aquatic therapy uh, can be useful. All right, so before we, we, we go through an example program, the, the patient says to us, well, you know, when can I return to, in the first case, driving, when, when am I going to be able to drive? Well, not until that graft is secure. So the minimum would be, you know, two to three weeks, depending on the graft. And they need to be able to hit the brake hard. So if you've had a right reconstruction and you're in a right hand drive car, it's going to be later than if you've had a left reconstruction. So essentially, they need to be able to to you know, sit in a car and push that brake co with confidence without pain, as simple as that. And that, that would be when they return to driving. Running is a little bit more complex, so they need to be full weight bearing. They need to have no effusion on the knee, 95% of knee flexion, about 80% of their quad strength, counter movement jump so that's where you bend down and jump back up again so you're flexing the knee and then pushing back so it's a, you know a, a plyometric springy what we call strength shortening cycle exercise about 80 percent pain-free jogging when some of your weight is taken so if you're using an aqua vest in a, in a swimming pool for example pain-free repeated single leg hops eventually so when you can do those, those would be the criteria to say you can go for a run, although we may be using running as an action as part of rehabilitation before that. OK, so that wouldn't you know, this this may be after about 12 weeks, but we would we would want to tick those boxes. So for some individuals, it may be early and for some individuals, it may be later. So, we're you know, we're not. Um, simply saying at 12 weeks you can go for a run. And then when it comes to return to sport, it's a bit more complex. The, the Aspeter guidelines look at return to elite sport. What we're looking at is return to activity which is relevant to that individual. So no pain or swelling, stable knee. Now the definition of what is a what is a stable knee is clearly something which is you know which is uh, takes def. So the knee can be stable passively so with the Lachman test or the arthrometer but it can also feel stable or feel unstable. So we would need to do a number of tests to to test that and we'll talk a little bit about those in a second. Secondly, if it doesn't feel stable, we judge that. So things such as the Tampa scale of kinesiophobia, this International Knee Documentation Committee test where you've got a variety of different symptoms. So you've got seven items which measure knee symptoms. You've got two functional items. You've got two sports activities. So these are um, test batteries which uh, we can score. You can also use you know, isokinetics if you've, if you've got access to that. If you haven't, then you can use a handheld dynamometer to measure strength. And if you haven't got that, you need simply um, you know, strengthen the resistance band or the amount of weight that you're, you're lifting. But either way, we want hamstrings and quads 
to be close to 100% of their, their, um, their contralateral leg um, before they're returning to sport. Counter movement jumps and drop jumps want to be more or less the same, and we'll look at that in a second. Running mechanics wants to be symmetrical. Jumping mechanics wants to be symmetrical. And sport or function specific, so you know, if it's a builder climbing a ladder, moving a wheelbarrow, if it's a farmer working on uneven ground, etc., you know, we would we would test these individually. So these are all criteria rather than time. So we sim we don't simply say, right, you've had nine months of rehab, off you go. We say, well, you can progress to the next phase when you can do this, 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 and this. So it's 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 criteria based. Okay, so um, let, let's take an aside and say, well, how, what are we going to do in terms of our rehabilitation? And, you know, we would need to look at this and say, well, who's going to, who's going to supervise this? If it's going to be that you've had physiotherapy and you're discharged after six, after six weeks, but that doesn't tally with our nine months of rehabilitation. So somebody has to supervise that, whether it's a, a therapist, whether it's a strength and conditioning coach, whatever, you know, there, there has to be that, that supervision or access to that supervision over that period. And so there are a couple of considerations in terms of strength and conditioning that we can talk about. So the first thing is that we are putting a stimulus on the knee and when we put a stimulus on the body during training, the body will change and the body will adapt. That adaptation doesn't occur when we're training, it occurs during the recovery period. So we need a balance between the challenge that we're putting onto the body and the recovery period. And if we get that challenge wrong, then we're not going to get the right result. So we talk about a functional change. So in other words, we're able to do more as a result of our exercise. So the performance is enhanced. We would call that a functional change. A non-functional change is where we're doing an activity and things are getting worse. So it could get worse because we're not doing enough. So you said, OK, I want you to do these thigh tightening exercises, so quads exercises, and they've been doing them for nine months. And so for the first couple of weeks, performance improved. But now the overload is not sufficient. And so the the function is not improved. Equally, they might have been doing an exercise four times a day. So they're not getting sufficient recovery. And so again, then it, 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 it's a non-functional change that they're getting or they're simply doing too much. So we've got this um, sort of sweet spot that we need where we're doing enough training, which is gradually getting harder and we're having enough recovery. And one of the things that we can do with that is use this FIT mnemonic. So it stands for frequency, intensity, time and type. And it'll be familiar with strength and conditioning coaches, less so for within the physiotherapy world. But basically it says, well, with any exercise, let's take a squat as an example. How often are we going to do it? How hard is it going to be? How long are we going to do it for? And how varied will it be? So with my squat, I might say, well, when you're standing and sitting from a chair, you can do that every day because it's not particularly hard. But when you're doing a heavy squat in the gym, you're going to do it a maximum perhaps of two or three times a week because you're going to need more recovery. So as the intensity is increased, the frequency has reduced. When it comes to time, we might say we'll do it for five minutes, but typically what we would say is sets and reps. So the number of repetitions that you do and the number of sets that you do, and there are various guidelines. So on the whole, we would say, well, you know, you do fewer repetitions with a larger weight, which is more likely to enhance strength. You do larger number of repetitions with 
a smaller resistance and it's more likely to work on endurance. Now both will work both and you can certainly enhance strength with higher repetitions but that would be a, a basic guideline. And then you say well I'm doing a, a squat and all I'm doing now is I'm holding a weight in a rucksack and I'm standing and sitting from a chair. Okay but that's just one exercise so let's vary it. So let's sometimes do it with one leg, sometimes do it with two legs, let's sometimes do it with a wide stance, a narrow stance, let's do it slowly, let's do it quickly, let's do it to a low chair, let's do it to a high chair. And that variety becomes important in terms of it matching the requirements of the patient, so-called specificity. So when we're, when we're looking at exercises and saying what, what can we do, a simple way of looking at that is known as the S factors of fitness. Stamina, suppleness, strength, speed, skill, structure, spirit, specificity. And we often have this on a little table on the gym wall. And each of these S factors expand into something else. So within the term stamina, I'm saying, well, huff and puff, so cardiopulmonary fitness, but also local muscle endurance. In terms of supinus, I'm including static, dynamic flexibility, agility, so change of direction drills, for example, with strength, concentric, eccentric, etc., etc. Spirit is to do with balance, coordination, fear avoidance, so the psychological aspects. Structure would be to, in this case, you know, the graft, but also, you know, body composition, how things are changing. Specificity would be to say how we're relating that exercise to their requirements. So with any exercise, what we're doing is we're looking at this and saying, well, what are we trying to achieve? So what we don't want to do is to pick five exercises where they all work on the same thing. So at some stage within our rehabilitation program, it needs to be balanced to consider most of those. And initially what we would do is a needs analysis and say, well, okay, which of those, if we're going to pick exercises, which of those S factors are important to this individual? So they're a farmer and they're walking over an uneven field so part of their task is balance changing on, on wet, boggy ground. So that's, a, 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 you know, something which is specific to them. And it wouldn't be as important for a young mum walking her kids to school, for example. So the, te the, the, the exercises that we choose for those two individuals would be different. And so we, by going through that, it's acting as a bit of a, a reminder as to what we use. All right, so we've got various different principles of training. And again, I'm not going to go through these because it's, it's, uh, it's another lecture. But these are the principles and these are the expanded versions. So individuality, specificity, adaptability, overload, progression, recovery and reversibility. So these would be things to think about. So individuality, I've got five people in front of me. They've all had an ACL reconstruction, but they're all slightly different. So the guidelines might say do this, this and this, but this person's had a hamstring tendon. This person's had a patella tendon. This person is a farmer. This person is an elite athlete. So therefore, I'm not going to give the same exercises for each of those. So individuality. That brings us on to specific specificity. And we can use another little mnemonic there, which is the said mnemonic. And it says specific adaptation to an imposed demand. So in other words, the change that the body is going to undergo is going to match your exercise. So if you want them to be better and more confident climbing a ladder, you've got to do something which is similar to climbing a ladder. You can't just do squats. So it, the, the adaptation will be similar. Adaptability simply means that you can adapt and you can become accustomed to a, a certain movement. So the fact that your knee has changed, you know, doesn't mean that you won't be fully functional. 
So if we take an example of the human body compared to a car, when, when a car is injured, it needs a mechanic to repair it. When the body is injured, initially the mechanic is the surgeon, but then the body continues to change and it adapts and it improves. The car stays exactly the same. Once you've changed the tire, it doesn't improve. So we, can, we are very adaptable. And the fact that you might not have full flexion, full extension, full power, doesn't mean that you can't be fully functional. So the fact that we see healing or non-healing on an MRI scan doesn't need doesn't necessarily reflect or predict full function. So, you know, we are adaptable beings. Overload simply means things have, you know, it's got to be hard, it's got to be tougher, and that overload would have to reflect the S factor. So the overload for flexibility might be bending your knee, the overload for strength might be lifting a weight. That overload needs to gradually get harder, so it would need to progress. So we would progress that relevant to the S factor. So range of motion, strength, for example. Remember that when we do that, you challenge the body. The body then needs time to change. So the recovery is important. And then if we get that wrong, we don't have enough recovery or we don't challenge sufficiently things can start to get worse. So we talked about setbacks and flare-ups, but ultimately we can reverse the changes. So those are our sort of principles of, of rehabilitation that we would need to be familiar with. Okay, so let's have a, a, a bit of a, a, you know, a, a recap on this and, and and uh, you know give some some examples and this is a table again i've pinched from my sports injuries book and we can basically we can change and talk about phases so we can say there's an early phase an intermediate phase an advanced phase so you know phases one two and three the early phase is more concerned with what's happened to you in surgery so the first three days you're recovering from surgery, from zero to two weeks, you're trying to get all of the muscles to work and you're considering what's happening to the graft in that phase. From two to six weeks and up to 12 weeks, we're then saying, well, now we're going to progress those S factors. So it might be open chain, closed chain, gradually increasing the range of motion depending on the graft. So initially we're going to say, you know, you're limiting your flexion to 60 degrees. We want to focus on getting full extension. And after 12 weeks, we might say, well, you know, um, we can now progress up to 90 degrees flexion. We're on some open chain work. We're on some closed chain work. We're doing it with body weight resistance. And eventually we're going to, perhaps after, after 10 to 12 weeks, we're then going to use an external resistance. And that would be dependent on symptoms. So, you know, can do and, and, and and a criteria. So we want to say, well, you're going to do a, a stand, a sit to stand movement. When you do that, your knee is wobbling all over the place and you're laterally flexing. So clearly you're not yet ready to do a, a free squat with body weight. And once you do that free squat with body weight, if you can control that, then we can start to add resistance. So we're criterion based and saying, well, when you can do that, you can you can progress to the next stage and that that is patient-centered care because each person will vary with that and then during the, the advanced stage then we're doing our needs analysis so, so we'll be thinking about our needs analysis through here so the needs here post-surgical needs here in terms of exercise progression but now we're saying well what is it you do what is your function what is your job what is your sport whether you do your, your lifestyle etc and we're then saying, well, OK, this is where you want to be. I want to be able to run around with my eight year old grandchild and I want to be able to do this. This is where you are now. So these are the steps that we need to take to get you to that level of progression. So you need a certain amount of flexibility. You certain you need an ability to take your weight onto one leg and perhaps twist. Now, at the moment, you're doing a sit to stand movement. 
you're not doing single leg work. So we need to progress onto that single leg work, keeping the foot straight. And eventually we'll gradually introduce some rotation. So we're doing that progressively, building onto that into that advanced stage. And once we get to that, the top of the rehab ladder, um, we should have full function. And we've prepared that individual that that can take a long time. So it can take, you know, 18 months, perhaps even two years. And the way that I will, I will say that to the patient is, it, you know, things will continue to improve up to two years. So, you know, when you, you think of your knee and you sort of think, oh, well, that's it. It isn't. It really isn't. The body is continuing to heal internally. What you need to do is continue to do something externally. What we need to do as therapists is to say, well, not everybody wants to go to a gym. So can we build that rehab into their lifestyle, so-called integrated exercise? So you're walking your kids to school. Well, OK, when you walk there before you've picked up your, your two year old, what about using a fast, a speed walk? What about doing some work on an uneven surface? What about striding out a little bit? So we're building it into their lifestyle. You know, you're standing cleaning your teeth. What about trying to stand on one leg? You know, build that up. If you can only do it for five seconds, build it up to 20 seconds, 30 seconds, etc. So we're building that into their lifestyle. All right. So that is our, our um, uh, um, rehabilitation. And we're then going to say, well, OK, you're going to return to your full function. So we mentioned this um, criteria. Let's have a brief um, look at return to sport criteria when, you know, the coach says, well, um, when is this person ready to to return? Well, we've got um, the time scale and we've got the criteria. So they're not going to be able to return to sport for a minimum of nine months. Why? Because of biological healing. Then we say, well, OK, so they've they've been um, 11 months. Can they return to sport? Well, they can if they can do this, this, this and this. So these are the criteria we're setting. They've got symmetry of muscle from side to side, symmetry of range of motion. Traditionally, um, jumping and hopping tests have been useful and they are useful, but it used to be um, distance where we would say, well, you know, can you hop 10 times, 20 times? Nowadays, the, 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 most of the research says that actually it's when you hit the floor, when you land from that hop, what your knee is doing is probably more important than the amount of time you can do it. So you could hop 10 times very poorly, and that would be poorer predictor of your return to sport than being able to hop five times correctly. So endurance would be really important, but you know the mechanics of that landing is probably important. Then particularly in, in sport, that would be a forwards and backwards movement. We need to in, we need to put some shearing stress on the knee because we know that this translation was what the ACL is trying to resist. So you know putting the foot down, acceleration, deceleration drills, cutting drills, change of direction drills. We would do all of these progressively. And once you can achieve those relevant to your sport, that sort of ticks the box. Jumping down from a height, so a, you know, a box jump upwards or a box jump downwards, so a drop height jump, a counter movement jump, these can be quite useful. And then we can put those together into um, a, uh, you know, a, a test. This is a particularly useful test, the landing error score system or less tour. And essentially what this is, you stand on a box and you jump down and then you jump back up again. And what we're interested in is not just your power, but your biomechanics. So what happens to your stance, your hip, your knee, your foot, your ankle, etc. And what we will do is observe that from in front um, to the side. Now I will use this educationally and I will video it on a smartphone from the front and from the side. And we go through these scores. So we say, well, okay, 
when you landed, you know, you were, you, you were, your stance was too wide, too narrow. Your foot position was turned out on one side and you had, your knees were knocking together, you know, you laterally flexed, et cetera, et cetera. And we would, we would show the patient this and say, well, you know, that's the problem. That's what we need to work on. But the less scoring system actually scores from sort of zero to one. And then we come up with an overall score. And so we can say to the athlete, well, actually, this score is 19 and you only scored five. So, you know, it gives them something to aim at, something which is quantifiable. And it gives both the therapist and, and the patient some knowledge. So it's an educational tool as well. And, and we can, you know, we can come up with these ourselves, can't we? We can say, well, OK, you're doing a sit to stand. That's an exercise. Let's video the sit to stand. Now, have a look at yourself doing this. Can you see what's happening with your knee? Let's see if we can recorrect that. So it's an educational um, opportunity and, and it's an experiential uh, form of education which can, which can be um, useful. All right, so that's a very rapid run through the guidelines. Um, you've got sort of further readings here contacts and further readings here um, to, to um, books. This book on sports and soft tissue injuries um, has information obviously on the knee. This book on back rehabilitation has a whole section on strength and conditioning in rehabilitation. So both of those uh, can be useful. All right. Thanks very much for watching.